Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Heaven's Harbinger, a Mother and Refuge production. On this episode, I'll be talking more about the divine will, our specific role in the divine will, what is expected of us, how we can live it, not only do it, but live it, all of that and more from the wise words of my friend Daniel O'Connor on this episode. Stay tuned. We'll be right back after this. All right, and as always, let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Come, Holy Spirit, please be with us right now. We love you and we thank you. We entrust this episode to you. May your will be done for your honor and your glory. Please use me as your little instrument. Speak through me to your people, to your beloved children of God right now. Please watch over us in your most holy name, Jesus Christ. I renounce all diabolical interference with this webcast. Please watch over this webcast. Please watch over all of the listeners and viewers. Please speak to their hearts and to their souls as you desire. Let your divine will be done. Let your divine will be done. Help us to give you our will. All through the intercession of our mother, our queen, and our refuge, as we pray, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. May all of the faults and failures belong to me, and may all of the praise, honor, and glory belong to you, Jesus Christ. We love you and we thank you. We come together now to learn about your divine will. Jesus, we trust in you. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. We give you our will. Please give us your will in return. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, dear family, so welcome back to another episode of Heaven's Harbinger this Sunday at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's good to be with you once again. This episode, I'm going to be using an article from my friend and colleague, Daniel O'Connor. I know so many of you know him and his work. He's touched thousands of souls through his amazing and incredible work on a lot of different things, but especially on the divine will of Luisa Picaretta and, and the writings from Jesus to Luisa Picaretta. So that's what this episode is going to be covering. As I mentioned last episode, I felt this urgency to fixate the majority of my content on the divine will, teaching what is the divine will, who is Luisa Picaretta, um, the difference between living in the divine will versus doing the divine will, all of that and so much more. There's so much to it, and I think it's the answer for our times that we're in, these very scary times, these very problematic times that we're in, in the church and the world. I think the divine will is the answer because Jesus is the answer and it's his divine will that we want to conform ourselves to that will help us bring about this era of peace and ultimately this kingdom and this it's the kingdom of the divine will on earth as it is in heaven that's the whole point so with that being said let's jump right into it here you should see this now is Daniel O'Connor's website so please make sure to go to his website Support him. This is his work. This is not my own work. We're going to be using his amazing resources and writings. Uh, all the links are in the description for you. Please make sure to use them. I think they're very helpful and beneficial. So as always, let's get right into it. I'm going to try to keep this nice and sweet uh, and simple for you guys today. So from Daniel's website, that it's titled Sure Ways to Live in the Divine Will. And up here, this little blue line you uh, you can see it says click here to download this page as a PDF formatted for printing. And if you do that, it brings out this really, really awesome, very handy thing. That there's this packet that you can print out. It's very well formatted and it covers everything about the divine will. So please make sure to look at this, use this, print this out, print tons of copies, hand these out to people, carry them in your car, in your purse. They're, this is so good to have. Um, so being able to spread this to people that you come across is a very helpful thing. So I have that in the description, that link in the description for you. But first, let's go into, according to Daniel O'Connor, what are some sure ways to live in the divine will? 
So I'm just going to go read through his writings and then I'll offer a couple things at the end of my own. But really, Daniel's writing and Daniel's work is so good that I just want to use that for this episode, to be honest with you. So here we go. Daniel says, in the gospel, we read the words of our Lord. The kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who, on finding one pearl of great value, went and sold all that he had and bought it. As we now stand at the threshold of the time of justice, God has revealed the fullness of that pearl to us. It is none other than the gift of living in the divine will. Indeed, Jesus here tells us that the pearl of great price is the kingdom of heaven. But now, with the gift of living in the divine will, he offers us the true life of heaven, even while on earth. So we don't have to be confused anymore by questions like, what is my calling? What is the best way to respond to the signs of the times? What is God really trying to say to the church and the world today? We don't have to search for any more pearls. This is it. Now, we could not possibly risk spending too much to purchase it. No sacrifice is too great for the greatest gift. So, like this wise merchant, we too must sell everything in order to obtain it. For without such a mindset, we cannot even properly embark upon this journey. Therefore, we must cast aside worldly advice and instead put all of our eggs in this one basket. Because this one basket is God. And God never disappoints, nor is he ever outdone in generosity. And thanks be to God, but much to the chagrin of the exploiters of God's grace, this pearl of great price is free, easy, and simple to obtain. Neither is it a secret. Jesus tells us clearly, through the servant of God, Louisa Picaretta, just how to proceed. The best thing I or anyone can do is to merely present you with things our Lord himself has said to Louisa in her diary, which she wrote under obedience to the church, writings referred to as the Book of Heaven. I would like to offer you a few points that have resonated with me from these remarkable writings. Before we dive into those, however, we must address three questions regarding misconceptions about this journey in the divine will. Number one, do I have to change everything in my spiritual life to live in the divine will? Get rid of all my old spiritual books so I can now read only divine will materials? Abandon all of my old devotional prayers so I can now recite only the prayers in Luisa's writings? Ignore all of those saints I used to, used to imitate so I can now focus only on the saints in the divine will? No. The answer is no to all of those questions. You don't have to do that. He continues. Our Lord addressed this to Louisa, quote, See then how easy it is to live in our will. The creature doesn't have to do new things, but just what she always does. That is to say, to live her life as we gave it, but in our will. End quote. Daniel continues, in fact, we work against receiving this gift if we abandon our former practices, because Jesus also told Louisa, quote, one who feels downhearted, dry, and deprived of my presence, and remains yet firm and faithful to her usual practices, comes to participate in the merits and goods which my mother acquired when I was lost. End quote. So we keep being ordinary good Catholics, doing what all the other ordinary good Catholics do, but in the divine will, which makes our lives extraordinary in truth, even if not in appearance. Okay, number two, is it easy or hard to live in the divine will? If this is the pearl of great price and we have to sell everything in order to purchase it, then wouldn't that be quite difficult, nearly impossible? No, it is not impossible, nor even difficult, because compared to this pearl, everything else that this world seems like garbage, everything else that is, that is in this world seems like garbage. If it does not, that mer that's merely because we don't know enough about the pearl or haven't bothered to really ponder it. And if selling even valuable items for a fair price is easy, how much easier is it to sell garbage? It is very easy, of course. And so, so is living in the divine will, if we truly want a gift so great. Now, it's still the way of the cross. There is no other way to be a Christian. 
much less a child of the kingdom of the divine will. But these crosses become sweetness in his will. Jesus says to Louisa, quote, Not too much is needed to live of my will. The too much is in the volition. If this decides and strongly and perseveringly wants it, already she has conquered mine and has made it hers. He also said, quote, My blessed daughter, tell me, what do you want? Do you want that my will reigns and lives in you as life? If you truly want it, everything is done. I do, I do not know how to teach difficult things, nor do I want impossible things. Rather, it is my usual way to make easy, for as much as it is possible for the creature, the most arduous things and hardest sacrifice. End quote. Always, always remember that as you continue your journey living in the divine will, always remember that as you continue your journey living in the divine will. Number three, do I need special hidden knowledge, secret formulas, and a guru teacher to live me in the, live in the divine will? Do you need those things? Daniel says, how easy it is to wrongly answer this question in the affirmative. It is tempting to look up to experts on the divine will as gurus, given the sheer daunting size of the book of heaven, which is 36 volumes, by the way. Well, we can perish that thought. It is certainly true that Jesus gives Louisa an enormous amount of teaching, some 8,000 pages or so. But this is for our benefit. It's like a long love letter written by a spouse, which the more we read, the more we ourselves fall in love. It's not like a textbook that we have to study, memorize, and master before a test so we don't fail it. Jesus says to Louisa, quote, if the soul removes the little stone of her will, at that very instant, she flows into me, and I into her. There are no paths, no doors, and no keys. It is enough for her to want it, and all is done. My will takes charge of everything. End quote. Essentially, this means that no one alive today is your guide to the divine will least of all myself. That's Daniel talking. Louisa is your guide, or more precisely, Jesus is your guide through his words to Louisa. And above all, God dwelling both within you and in his real presence in the Eucharist is your guide. So all I can do is share with you some of those words from our Lord and a brief few words of my own commentary on them. Namely, I want to talk about desire for the for the divine will and its universal reign, submission to the divine will in everything, love and purity, courage and trust, detachment and emptiness, devouring knowledge of the divine will, devotion to Our Lady, and doing our acts in the divine will. As all of these things are described by our Lord in the Book of Heaven. Daniel continues, first of all, desire. We need to fuel our desire for the gift of living in the divine will, and we need to crave its universal reign on earth to the point that our desire is like a raging fire. But how? How do we go about actually making sure that we desire, that we crave something? For one might think that what we desire is outside of our control, but that is not true. How we feel is not always under our control. And Jesus promises Louisa that he does not look at how we feel, but desire is deeper. As Christians, we are often confronted with the task of exercising the will in order to modify our desires. This should be a process that anyone undertakes after conversion. When one becomes a Christian, he realizes that he needs to get rid of the desires that have become so ingrained in his soul. Desires for bad music, bad movies, bad company, bad behaviors in general, and in turn, replace them with desires for holy things. Instead of defending to the death whatever inclinations and tastes he finds pre-existing in his nature. One need only glance at the destruction of society currently running rampant even condoned recently by our nation's Supreme Court, by those who insist upon defending instead of forming properly their natural desires. 
But how does the Christian go about this modification of desire? First of all, by remembering, in other words, choosing to remind himself of the existence, the truth, and the beauty of these holy things that he should desire. Correspondingly, this is what we need to do to foster a desire for the divine will. Jesus tells Louisa that every good in life has its beginning in the memory. So we choose to continually remind ourselves of and ponder the rightful object of our desire. By doing this, all three powers of the soul operate together. The will chooses, the memory remembers, and the intellect thinks. Specifically, we must remind ourselves of we, we must remind ourselves of, read, and meditate on the following assurances from our Lord in order to truly enlarge our desire. Therefore, let us talk briefly about what Jesus promises to those who live in his will, and what Jesus promises about the soon-to-come worldwide reign of his will on earth. Everything you could possibly legitimately want is contained within the gift of living in the divine will. This is, first of all, true, because all that ultimately matters is pleasing God. That's all that matters. And this is what pleases him the most. In fact, Jesus promises that living in the divine will on earth gives you precisely the same sanctity as that which the blessed in heaven possess, and yet renders you even more pleasing to him due to the fact that you can still suffer redemptively and you can still earn merit. Not one drop more of merit can actually be obtained after you die. Now, it is impossible for one living in the divine will to be lost. Yes, Jesus assures Louisa of that many times. But it's even impossible for one who dies while living in the divine will to go to purgatory. Jesus says that even the entire universe would rebel if this were to happen, though it is impossible. He says, quote, Therefore, the first thing that my will does is to remove purgatory beforehand, making it done in advance in order to be freer to make her live in my will and to form its life as pleases it more. So if the creatures were to die after one decided and wanted act of living in my volition, she will take flight toward heaven. End quote. So Daniel continues. And when one does arrive in heaven... Having lived in the divine will on earth, she is granted the highest possible place. Joining the royal cortege of Our Lady, the Queen of Heaven, who until now has been deprived of this royal cortege. So in the divine will, we are all set after this life regarding our safety. But what about during it? Well, Jesus cares about that as well. He talks constantly to Louisa about the chastisements which are, which are soon coming, but he also promises protection from them for the children of his will, who are also the true children of his mother, and he has granted her the right to defend all of them against chastisements. Jesus showed Louisa that, quote, the sovereign queen descended from heaven with an indescribable majesty and a tenderness all maternal. And she went around in the midst of creatures in all the nations, and she marked her dear children and those who must not be touched by the scourges. Each one my celestial mother touched, the scourges had no power to touch those creatures. Sweet Jesus gave the right to his mother of placing in safety whomever she pleased. Oh, if everyone could see with how much love and tenderness the celestial queen did this office, they would cry from consolation, and they would love she who loves them so much. End quote. But what about all of the other crosses in life, aside from the looming chastisements? Living in the divine will is still indeed the way of the cross, as we said, but even the form of those crosses changes completely for one who lives in his will. Jesus promises that no pain, no suffering or unhappiness of any kind can truly enter into the center of the soul of one who lives in his will. Jesus tells Louisa, quote, my daughter, one who lives in my will enters the divine order. And since our divinity is incapable of pain, nothing, even the slightest thing, can in the least shade our perennial and infinite happiness. And as much as creatures offend us, the pain, the offenses, 
remain outside of us, never inside. In the same way, for one who lives in my will, pain cannot enter her soul. Pain remains outside of the soul, that is, in the human nature. And so she feels pain without pain, sorrow without sorrow, because pain and sorrows cannot enter the sacrarium of my will. They are forced to remain outside. The soul feels them, sees them, touches them, but they do not enter into her center. End quote. Daniel continues. Now we could go on for many hours speaking of the glories of the gift of the divine will for the soul, but sometimes it can be easier to foster our desire for the divine will when we meditate upon its universal reign on earth. When his will is done on earth as it is in heaven, as promised and prophesied by God incarnate in the most important prayer of history, the prayer he himself taught us, the Our Father prayer, because one who lives in the divine will indeed enjoys all of its benefits, but he still finds himself struck in this world, which is usually dead set on doing the very opposite of the, of the divine will, mired in unprecedented levels of sin and darkness as it is. So let us see what Jesus tells us about this soon to come reign of his will on earth. What is the best thing about the coming reign? The fact that its arrival is guaranteed. Our Lord has decreed it. Everything else is nothing. No one can stop it. No force on heaven, earth, or hell can stop it. No matter how many people wrongly call it heresy, no matter how much the devil and his minions fight against it, no matter how much even misguided Catholics fight against it, it is coming. It is coming. First, Understand that it is not a heresy. It is not millenarianism. It does not speak of a visible reign of Jesus in the flesh on earth before his final coming. Because millenarianism is a heresy. But that's not what this is. It does not entail an end of the age of the church. Rather, it entails an era where the church will acquire her full vigor and where Jesus reigns in the power of his divine will spiritually. So, why can we be so confident in its coming? For many reasons. One of them is that everything Jesus said to Louisa about what was supposed to come in the 20th century already has happened. Let's take a moment to look at just a snippet of that. On April 17th, 1906, Louisa was shown great chastisements, specifically earthquakes in three different cities. The next day, the great San Francisco earthquake happened. Four months later, the 1906 Valparaiso earthquake occurred in Chile, which killed even more people. Two years later, the great 1908 Messina earthquake occurred, the worst and deadliest earthquake in European history. And she was also shown it the morning before it happened. The next month, she was shown a vision of thousands of people dying from earthquakes, fire, and water. But she said that somehow it seemed all of those were just precursors to nearing wars. The following year, she saw in the world wars, revolutions, which were imminent. Three years later, World War I broke out. Four months after its official start, Louisa said, quote, Jesus keeps telling me that the wars and the scourges which are occurring now are still nothing. That other nations will go to war. And not only this, but that they will wage war against the church. End quote. Then, right after World War I, she was clearly told that a worse war would come, involving even more nations and more death. Jesus said, quote, But I will use this for my highest purposes, and the reunion of so many races will serve to facilitate the communications of the truths, so that they may dispose themselves for the kingdom of the supreme fiat. So, the chastisements that have occurred are nothing other than the preludes of those that will come. My justice can bear no more. My will wants to triumph and would want to triumph by means of love in order to establish its kingdom. But man does not want to come to meet this love. Therefore, it is necessary to use justice. End quote. So the bottom line is that if Jesus promises Louisa that something is going to happen, it's going to happen, period. History has already proven that without a doubt. With that confidence, then, we can read more of Jesus' words to Louisa. In response to Louisa's question, how will this kingdom of the divine will ever be able to come? Sin abounds and evil gets worse. Jesus responds by saying, quote, 
my daughter, everything is possible for us. The impossibilities, the difficulties, the insurmountable obstacles of creatures melt before our supreme majesty, like snow in front of a burning sun. Everything is in whether we want it. All the rest is nothing. If we have put these writings forth, it is because we know for certain that they will bring forth their fruit and will establish the kingdom of our volition in the midst of creatures. The time will come that they will, comp they will compete for who will be able to know these truths more. Therefore, do not think about it. It is a question of time. I, who know how things will go, I do not stop. End quote. So it is indeed coming, but how soon it comes and who partakes of its glory depend upon our response. So to inflame our desire for it, let us now look at some things Jesus told Louisa about it. First of all, he calls it almost a return to the original state before the fall. Now, our Lord does not explain exactly what that almost refers to, but it is certainly as important as we must always first and foremost submit to church teaching, which tells us that the battle against sin does not definitively end until the final coming of our Lord and the universal judgment and resurrection. Nevertheless, we can rest assured that the fiat voluntas tua on earth as it is in heaven will be just as glorious as Eden in its own way. In fact, more so now that we have Christianity. Jesus says to Louisa, quote, Man degraded himself and lost all goods because he went out of my divine will. In order to ennoble himself, to reacquire everything and receive the rehabilitation of the marriage with his creator, he must enter once again the divine fiat from which he came. There are no ways in the middle. My will was the beginning, and by justice, one who is the beginning must also be the end. Therefore, humanity must be enclosed in my divine volition to be given back her noble origin, her happiness, and to place the marriage with her creator in force once again. This is why all the divine yearnings, the sighs, the manifestations, are directed toward making our will known in order to make it reign. We have to remember that the way the world is now was not God's original plan, nor is it the way the world always was. This is how the world became 6,000 years ago when Adam disobeyed God. Remember that the world before the fall was not heaven. Rather, it was still the world. But God never lets any good deed go undone. Just as in his passion, he did not withhold even one drop of blood, so too it will be with the whole history of the world, a good so great as returning the temporal earth to the glory of its original design is a good too great to be a good too great to be possible for God to leave undone. It would go against his very nature to simply annihilate the world in the depths of its misery and let eternity take its place before the misery has been resolved would be like the bridegroom welcoming a filthy and wretched bride to the wedding. Instead, the bride is bedecked with jewels and adorned first, as the book of Revelation tells us. So it must be, and so it will be, with the world before the final coming of the Lord. But when will this be? Soon. As I said, just how soon depends on us. But it will be soon, nevertheless. Jesus told Louisa that, quote, Every 2,000 years, I have renewed the world. In the first 2,000 years, I renewed it with a deluge. That's the great flood of Noah. In the second 2,000 years, I renewed it with my coming upon earth when I manifested my humanity. That's the earthly life of Jesus. Now, we are around the third 2,000 years, and there will be a third renewal. In this third renewal, after the earth will be purged and a great part of the current generation destroyed, I will be even more generous with creatures. This is also why I often speak to you about living in my will, which I have not manifested to anyone until now. The 2000th anniversary of redemption is coming up, the year 2033. Or if we take the anniversary by the dates given to Blessed Anne Catherine Emmerich, it's even sooner by several years. There is simply no way around it. 
we are living in the most exciting and urgent time in the history of creation. Not only that, but we are the most privileged people in the history of creation because by the mere fact that we know of this, Jesus is inviting us to be the very ones who help usher in this era of peace, each and every one of us. We, of course, do not know exactly what will come or exactly when. To desire such knowledge would be to desire a gift even Our Lady herself did not have on earth, as she walked by faith, not by sight. But in order to inflame our desire for the divine will and its universal reign, we should indeed readily devour any knowledge that God has chosen to give us about it. So what else has Jesus told us through Louisa about this reign? Plenty of things. But we'll just look at a few items now. First of all, the world is going to be absolutely full of people. Immediately after the chastisements, it will not be so, for they will wipe out a large portion of humanity. But that will change. Jesus said to Louisa, quote, You must know that our adorable majesty, informing the creation, established that every place was to be populated by inhabitants, and that the earth was to be extremely fertile and rich with abundant plants, in such a way that all would have an abundance. Look at the sky, how populated with stars it is. The earth was to be the echo of the sky, crammed with inhabitants, and it was to produce so much as to render everyone rich and happy. Oh, how many great things will the kingdom of my divine fiat do, so much so that all the elements are all in waiting, the sun, the wind, the sea, the earth, and all creation to deliver from their womb all the goods and effects that they contain. End quote. In other words... The good things we now experience from the elements, the power of the sun to cause vegetation to grow, food to nourish, and so forth, is now at a mere fraction of what it should be. Come the era of the divine will, they will give forth what God intended. It will not be supernatural as in heaven, it will still be natural, but natural as originally designed by God in its fullness. Even now, we're shown hints of what soon will be the ordinary. Well-trained animals are perfectly obedient to their owners. In this coming era, all animals will be perfectly obedient to all men. Even now, some species of bamboo can grow three feet in a single day. In this era to come, the most delicious and nutritious fruits will grow like only the most troublesome weeds do in the present era. Some places on this earth are so naturally beautiful that when you visit them, you cannot help but immediately think of God. And you almost wonder if you're in heaven. In the era to come, the entire face of the planet will be like that. And all of that is, of course, nothing but symbol and effect of the transfiguration of society and of souls that will take place. Even now, some monasteries on this earth are run perfectly, with Jesus in the Eucharist as their true head and ruler, and are the and are veritable saint factories with all the monks and nuns living in them in perfect accord with each other and with God. In the era to come, that will be the case with the entire world. But this will still be an earthly pilgrimage away from the celestial fatherland. However, in this era that is to come, when our earthly pilgrimage ends, it will not be like death how we now know it. Jesus tells Louisa that it could barely even be called death. It is more of a mere transition where one act is done on this side of the grave and with the next act you do, you find yourself in heaven. Jesus says to Louisa, quote, The kingdom of my fiat will enclose all goods, all miracles, the most sensational prodigies. Even more, it will surpass them altogether. Death will no longer have power in the soul, and if it will have it over the body, it will not be death but transit. The bodies also will not be subject to decomposing, but they will remain composed in their sepulchers, waiting for the day of the resurrection of all. My will will have no need to make miracles because it will preserve people always healthy, holy, and beautiful, worthy of that beauty that came out of our creative hands in creating the creature. The kingdom of the divine fiat will make the great miracle of banishing all evils, all miseries, all fears, this in the souls. 
but also in the body. There will be many modifications because it is always sin that is the nourishment of all evils. Once sin is removed, there will be no nourishment for evil. More so, since my will and sin cannot exist together, therefore the human nature also will have its beneficial effects. End quote. Daniel continues, we will still have faith in this era of peace, whereas faith will cease in heaven. But faith in the kingdom of the divine will will be a clear thing, which not even an obstinate fool would be likely to deny. Jesus says that faith now is difficult for some to have because it is like insisting upon the existence of the sun on an extremely cloudy day. But in the reign of the divine will, faith will be like recognizing the sun on a perfectly clear day. Jesus says, quote, When my will has its kingdom upon earth and souls live in it, faith will no longer have any shadow, but everything will be clarity and certainty. The light of my volition will bring in the very created things, the clear vision of their creator. Now they are almost like blind people who must believe others that a God exists. But when my divine fiat reigns, its light will make them touch the existence of their creator with their own hands. Therefore, it will no longer be necessary for others to say, for others to say it, the shadows, the clouds will exist no more. End quote. Jesus even tells Louisa that the music of the celestial fatherland and music of the heavenly bodies will truly echo through the kingdom of the divine fiat, such that one would no more question the beauty and the design of it then one would now question the reality of a symphony he is attending. This is indeed what many poets, astronomers, philosophers, and theologians have spoken of by way of the music of the spheres, which now we can only intellectually observe by studying the universe. In the era to come, we will hear that. Now, I hope all of this makes you crave the kingdom of the divine will on earth. That's a good thing. But remember... Jesus wants this even more than we do. He said, quote, And then there is another waiting, more sorrowful still, the yearning, the ardent desire, the long anxieties for the kingdom of my divine will. It is about 6,000 years that I am waiting that the creature re-enters into it. My creature suffering is the continuous waiting. Excuse me, my greater suffering is the continuous waiting. My gazes are always fixed on souls. And as I see that a creature has fallen into sin, then I wait and I wait again for her return to my heart in order to pardon her. The hours, the days that I wait seem years to me. Oh, how hard it is to wait. But he also said, quote, at the most, it will be a question of time. Our power will make such prodigies. Man will abound with new graces, new love, new light, so that our dwellings will recognize us and they themselves with spontaneous will will give us the dominion. Therefore, you pray and may your cry be continuous. May the kingdom of your fiat come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you. So that's what we must do. Those are our orders while we are waiting. Our cry for the kingdom to come must be continuous. Now, I know some who are hearing this are doubting. And I understand. I won't hold that against you. These are incredible sayings. But let me just ask you this. Why not? Why not take these orders? Why not pray the greatest petition of the greatest prayer with all of your heart? Why not pray it with fervor, trust, and faith that it truly can be fulfilled in the most clear and undeniable way? Why not say continuously with all of your strength, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven? Why not? But for this cry to be truly heard, and as powerful as possible before God? We must make this cry when we ourselves are in his divine will. So continuously hold all of this before your mind to encourage you. Because there is much work for us to do, to live and pray and act in the divine will. 
submission to the divine will in everything. In dogmatic theology, we speak of a distinction between God's permissive will and God's ordained will. And it is a very important distinction. It is the distinction between those things that God specifically wants to happen or specifically causes himself versus those things that God does not want, that God does not want in and of themselves, but which he permits in order to allow for a greater good to come from them, which could not possibly come any other way. However, this distinction, it is not a useful one when we are considering how to react what already has happened or is happening. In fact, in that case, it's worse than useless. It is specifically dangerous because it, it disposes us to rebellion instead of submission. And submission to the divine will is truly everything. It's everything. St. Alphonsus Liguori, a doctor of the church and one of the best spiritual guides in church history, wrote, quote, it is certain and of faith, meaning dogmatic, that whatever happens, happens by the will of God. Mother Teresa was once asked, Mother, how do I know God's will? She just smiled, paused, and responded, See what happens. The 18th century Jesuit spiritual master, Father Kassad, taught that, quote, the true philosopher's stone is submission to the will of God, which changes into divine gold all occupations, troubles, and sufferings. Oh my God, how much I long to be the missionary of your holy will and to teach all men that there is nothing more easy, more attainable, more within reach and in the power of everyone than sanctity. Sanctity, then, consists in willing all that God wills for us. Yes, sanctity of heart is a simple fiat, a conformity of will with the will of God. Father Kassad pointed out that everything was identical between the two thieves crucified with our Lord, everything except submission to the will of God. One submitted, one rebelled. It is that simple. Now, there are two heresies we need to steer clear of, providentialism and quietism whereby we are basically passively and blindly indifferent to circumstances and our role in affecting them. But staying away from these heresies is not as difficult as most people make it out to be. Usually the circumstances make it quite clear whether we are to do something about a situation or not. For example, is there discord between you and someone else? If there is something moral that you can reasonably do to be at peace with this person, then do it. If not, if you have done nothing wrong and are doing nothing wrong, then God is arranging these circumstances to help detach you from creatures, perhaps even your very closest loved ones, so that you could be more attached to him alone. Have you come down with a sickness or injury? Take your doctor's advice, even if it's to take pain medications, and then rejoice in whatever suffering remains after that. Because it consists in God taking direct control over your, your motiv mortification, which is so much better and so much easier than us trying to figure out mortification on our own. This applies just as well to small everyday matters. Are you stuck behind someone who is driving too slowly? Pass him if you can, safely and legally. Otherwise, you're called to be patient, prayerful, and relishing God's will in slowing you down because he wants you to pray more before you reach your destination. If we are truly honest with ourselves, there is rarely confusion on what we should do. The problem is not knowing. The problem isn't not knowing. It's not willing. And in terms of how we should react interiorly to anything whatsoever, that is always completely clear. With peace and submission. Our reaction should never, ever consist in complaining, annoyance, moodiness, irritation, resentment, or anything resembling these. About annoyance, Jesus tells Louisa, quote, My daughter, one who really loves me, never gets annoyed about anything, but tries to convert all things into love. The weight of any action, be it even an indifferent one, increases according to the dose of love it contains. Therefore, I want no annoyance in you but always peace. Because in annoyances, in disturbances, it is always the love of self that wants to come out to reign, or the enemy to do harm. End quote. Submission to God's will in our lives is also about never asking 
why. But instead, as St. Paul admonishes us in Thessalonians, in all circumstances, giving thanks, for this is God's will. Here is what Jesus tells Louisa about asking why. This is what he says, quote, In almost all of the events that occur, creatures keep repeating over and over again. And why, and why, and why? Why this illness? Why this scourge? The explanation of why is not written on earth, but in heaven, and there everyone will read it. Do you know where why was created? In hell. Who was the first one that pronounced it? A demon. There is no evil in the world which does not carry the mark of why. Why is destruction of divine wisdom in souls. And do you know where why will be buried? In hell. To make them restless for eternity without ever giving them peace. So, instead of asking why to the difficulties that life presents... We need to, above all, pay special attention to the divine will operating in our lives in the crosses and sufferings in order to always bear them with patience, resignation, and prayer. Louisa says about suffering for love of Jesus, quote, O oh, coin of inestimable value, if all of us knew it, we would compete with one another to suffer more. But I believe we are all short-sighted in knowing this coin so precious. End quote. Because the cross and the cross alone reveals who we really are, everything else, and that truly means everything, even the sacraments, can be loved without true love existing in the heart. So our reaction to crosses tells us who we are with certainty. Jesus said to Louisa, quote, My daughter, it is really so. The cross alone is that which one is that which makes one know whether he really loves the Lord, but a cross carried with patience and resignation? Because where there is patience and resignation in crosses, there is divine life. Since nature is so reluctant to suffering, if there is patience, it cannot be something natural, but divine. On the other hand, in the other things, and even the very sacraments, cannot give the certainty of the cross. He also said, quote, My daughter, it was not my works, nor my preaching, nor the very power of my miracles that made me recognized with clarity as the God I am. But when I was put on the cross and lifted up on and lifted up on it as though on my own throne, then was I recognized as God. So the cross alone revealed me to the world and to the whole of hell for who I really was. All were shaken and recognized their creator. Therefore, it is the cross that reveals God to the soul and makes known whether the soul is truly of God. It can be said that the cross uncovers all the intimate parts of the soul and reveals to God and to men who she is. Quote. Louisa was even told by a soul in purgatory how to know how you stand before God. And this soul assured Louisa that, quote, it takes nothing to know whether you are doing well or badly. If you appreciate suffering, you are doing well. If you don't, you are doing badly. End quote. This does not mean we need to be ascetic monks. We should indeed do penance, weekly fasting and mortification. It should regular it should be regular but not constant, significant but not severe, and above all, judged entirely by the love with which we undertake it, and not the external apparent degree of the sacrifice. And much more important, even than the mortifications we impose intentionally upon ourselves, is how we react to the crosses that providence places in our lives. But allow me to present one more point before we move on to the next item. Just as much as whatever has happened is God's will, so too, whatever has not yet happened has not happened because of the fact that it was not God's will. So it is just as important that we submit ourselves to the divine will in what has not happened, instead of being envious or resentful because of what our life seems to lack, even if it appears to be a holy thing that we lack. Do you envy a friend who has the perfect parish, the perfect family, who goes on the perfect pilgrimages? 
Here's what our Lord says to Louisa about that. He said, quote, My daughter, the more things of which the soul deprives herself down here, the more she will have up there in heaven. So the poorer on earth, the richer in heaven, the more she is deprived of tastes, pleasures, amusements, trips, strolls on earth, the more tastes and pleasures she will have in God. So one who leaves the earth takes heaven, be it even in the smallest thing. Therefore, it follows that the more one is despised, the more he is honored. The smaller, the greater, the more submitted, the more dominant, and so with all the rest. Yet, of the mortals, who thinks of depriving himself of something on earth to have it eternally in heaven? Almost no one. End quote. Even if the thing you do, even if the thing you do not have is something that you have not willfully and specifically chosen to deprive yourself of, but rather it's something that God simply has not blessed you with, then still, offer that up. Simply offer your fiat to God regarding whatever is lacking in your earthly life, and you receive a thousand times that in heaven, just by submitting. Love and purity of intention. Okay, let's see how much left we have here. We have a good amount. Well, there's a lot on here. I'm trying to think how much I want to go into that. I'm thinking I'm going to stop it there and perhaps next episode I can do the, the second half because I don't want to do too much. Um, I know this is a lot. There's a lot of amazing content that I've covered in this episode episode from Daniel O'Connor. Again, this is all his work that I'm simply reading. Um, please make sure to check his website out and read this, pray with this, take notes on this yourself. But I think for the next episode, I will pick up on love and purity of intention. But I think I want to stop it here for this episode because we're already at 52 minutes. Um, and I think we've talked about a lot. But before we finish this episode, just a couple things that stood out to me in regards to all of that wonderful work from Daniel. I know there's a lot there, but we have a role to play in all of this, dear family. You and I have a very important role to bring about this kingdom of the divine will on earth as it is in heaven. We can't just be passive bystanders watching from the sideline. We are called to have a very important part, a very important role in making this happen. Obviously, God in his power and providence is the one that's going to make it happen, but it's through our cooperation, through our active participation that it's going to come about. So what do we need to do? Well, as Daniel mentioned so beautifully in this, this article that he wrote, there's several things. One, start living in the divine will by simply doing everything you're already doing. Your rosary, divine mercy chaplet, your fasting, going to mass, going to adoration, all of these different devotions and beautiful practices that you're doing, these pious devotions and practices, keep doing them. The only thing is that do them intentionally and specifically in the divine will for the honor and glory of God and praying multiple times throughout the day, Jesus, I trust in you, your kingdom come, your will be done. I give you my will. Please give me your will in return. Jesus, I trust in you. I give you my will. Please give me your will in return. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Pray that multiple times a day and mean it. Don't just say it. Mean it. So everything you do, do it in submission and conformity to the divine will of God. That's the difference between living in the divine will, which is what we're called to do, versus doing the divine will. Doing the divine will is simply just obeying commands, taking orders, and that's that, which is still good to do, but it's not the best thing. And we want to give God our best. So live in his divine will by doing everything that you're already doing as far as your prayer. Maybe try to add a little more if you can, but do it all intentionally as an act of being and living in the divine will of God for his honor and his glory. That will help bring about this kingdom of the divine fiat, the divine will, the supreme fiat, this third era. That is another thing that stood out to me. The Every 2,000 years, God has come and, and renewed the earth. The first time, the great deluge, the flood of Noah, Noah's ark. The second time when Jesus Christ in his birth, his life, and his death. And the third time, which we are approaching around 2030, 2033, 
of the third fiat, where he will come again to reign in the divine will and where his will and the kingdom of his divine will will reign on earth. It will reign on earth as it is in heaven. Dear family, there's so much to look forward to. There is so much to look forward to. And that's why I chose this picture on the cover. There's clouds. There's a lot of clouds out there today. And yet we have the sun. The sun is rising. The sun is coming. Keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Trust in Jesus. Surrender your past to the divine mercy of Jesus. Entrust your future to the divine providence of Jesus. And live right now in the present moment in the divine will of Jesus. And everything will be okay. You will have peace. You will have hope. You will have purpose and meaning in your life. You have been chosen since the beginning of time to live in these crazy times, to be a witness of love and a light in the crazy darkness of this world. You have been chosen. You were created for that. Don't run away from that. Don't shy away from that. We have a role in this. To know the divine will, to live in the divine will, and to share and proclaim that divine will to the ends of the world. That is our mission, dear family. Know of my gratitude for you, my prayers for you. As always, this is all for the triumph of the Immaculate Heart and the reign of the Sacred Heart, which will take place in this era of peace, the time of this divine will, this era of the divine will, this reign of the divine will, the triumph. That's what this is all for, is to help hasten that, to make these messages known. So join me. Join this YouTube channel. Join your brothers and sisters in Christ, in knowing the divine will, living in the divine will, and proclaiming it to the world. We'll pick up next time, dear family, on the second half of that article, that wonderful article by Daniel O'Connor. But thank you so much for watching this episode of Heaven's Harbinger. Please know of my, my love, my prayers, my gratitude for all of you. Until next time, this is Heaven's Harbinger. God bless you, dear family. Mm -hmm.